You are welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 22, intended for those who study alone or who lead discussion groups with men. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, published in 2022, note that green curly brackets contain variant readings from the 5th century or earlier Greek manuscripts. We now enter Paul's third missionary journey, leaving Antioch, traveling across land, visiting cities where he had planted churches in his previous visits, heading back to Ephesus, where, according to chapter 18, during a brief visit, he enjoyed a friendly reception in the local synagogue. We are still in section 6 of the book of Acts. Paul preaches the gospel to the Greeks. Amongst other facts, we shall seek to find out what authority Jesus gave to his appointed apostles that is greater than our authority. Secondly, what could we do to help to spread biblical truth across our city and region? What is the proper formula that we should pronounce at baptisms? And what should be the outcome of Christian training programs? A few facts about the city of Ephesus. Its earliest reference may be to the city of Apassas, which was sacked by Hittites in the 14th century BCE. It was now an official Roman government seat for the province of Asia, a port city, a hub of trade, commerce, and government. The population may have reached or surpassed a quarter of a million, ranking in size only behind Rome, Alexandria, Egypt, and Antioch of Syria. Archaeologists have uncovered multi-tiered homes of the rich, having frescoes and pools. Road markers in the province indicate a distance from Ephesus. Archaeology has further found more than 3,500 inscriptions. The city boasted of having made a covenant with the goddess Artemis, known as Diana in Latin. Her temple was one of the seven wonders of antiquity. Folk in the city also worshipped some 50 other gods and goddesses. This ancient statue of Artemis, the Lady of Ephesus, in Greece, where she was worshipped primarily as a mother goddess adorned with large beads. Excavations in 1987 and 88 identified tear-shaped amber beads that had been hung on the original wooden statue carried over into later sculptured copies. Some scholars suggest that these represent figs. If you are studying alone, stop and read these verses. If you are in a group, have someone read aloud verses 1 and 2. Note that these events took place between the years 51 and 53, or about 20 years after Jesus' resurrection. These men are called disciples. Whose disciples were they? Jesus' disciples or disciples of John the Baptist? Discuss, when do Christians normally receive the Holy Spirit? Note that this text uses a participle of simultaneous action, as in 1117. And then ask, how did the first Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles know that they had received the Holy Spirit? Think about the promises of Jesus and possible evidences. Further discuss, what did these disciples not yet believe? Let everyone answer who wishes, do not contradict any, and then note these probable points of doctrine that they had not yet learned. The crucifixion of Jesus, his resurrection from death, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and baptism done in Jesus' name. Note, some of those who had been baptized by John had returned to other cities, baptizing other Jews in turn with John's baptism.
Read verses 3 and 4. Note that the term into is the Greek preposition eis, which can be translated into, unto, towards, respecting, and by many other terms. More about that later. Remember, John himself had said, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Repentance, in connection with John, meant to confess one's sins, expecting Messiah soon to come, followed by divine judgment. In the Greek New Testament, the term baptism occurs with five different prepositions. One may be baptized en or in water, one same or Holy Spirit, in fire, in the Jordan River, or in the cloud that followed Israel. The preposition ace is used to introduce repentance, the name of the Lord Jesus or Christ, or, Paul said, in my name. It is used with the forgiveness of sins, with Jesus' death, and even baptism unto Moses. The preposition hu pa, meaning done by John. Epi, or upon the name of Jesus Christ, and Huper, baptism on behalf of the dead. Note that English prepositions often do not correspond to Greek ones, so we must learn and respect Greek usage. So we must learn and respect Greek usage. Have someone read aloud verses 5 and 6. Note how some ancient manuscripts tried to make the text more clear by inserting some short phrases. Here again we have the Greek preposition ace, used for baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, possibly meaning baptized with faith in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus himself had said to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Is this a contradiction? I suggest that when we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, we are in effect baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for this is what we do, though not necessarily what we say. The phrase, they spoke in tongues and prophesied, is a Greek hendiades, that is, two words or phrases used of a single event. We could quite properly translate this, they prophesied in tongues. So we ask, how did Paul know that they were prophesying? Because they did so in a language that he understood. Read verses 8 and 9. There was a synagogue in Ephesus, as inscriptions and Josephus testify to its presence and to prominent Jews in local government. The term argued translate the Greek term that gives us the English word dialogue. That is, he was not preaching a monologue, he was engaging in lively conversation. Read verse 10. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Consider laying an action plan to take the word of the Lord to every ethnic community in Portland City and in Multnomah County before the year 2025. What would you do? For help, see such sites as scriptureearth.org, where one can download Bible translations in hundreds of languages. Then see the site peopleofyes.com, which provides a detailed step-by-step -step plan for covering a region with the gospel, winning souls, and planting churches. Then see naturalchurchdevelopment.org after a few seconds, an offer will appear for a free ebook. Download that ebook and read it.
Have someone read verses 11 and 12. Ask or discuss, what gifts did the original apostles have that we do not have today? Note 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, where Paul said that there were signs that accompanied authentic apostles. Then ask, what would we have to do in order to see more healing and freedom in others? Not the fake stuff that we see on the internet. Read together James 5.13-16. through 16. Read aloud verse 13. Note that all major religions attempt to cast evil spirits out of humans, beasts, or places by use of powerful words, names, symbols, or potions. Read verses 14, 15, and 16. I know Jesus, uses the Greek verb gnosko, which usually means to know by experience, and I know Paul, using the Greek verb epistemai, which means to know something well, having studied it. This text poses a particular historical problem, for there was no Jewish high priest named Sceva. So, is this another error in the Bible? Well, all the Jewish high priests are well known by name, for records have been kept from antiquity. In the period in question, the names of all of the high priests are well known. So we go to language sources. The Diccionario Griego Español notes that in Egypt and in Syria, this term archireos could be used of high-ranking priests who served several divinities. In Greece, it could be used of any priest of the god Zeus. And in the mystery cults, some leaders were called commander and high priest. And in Rome, the word could be used of the priest in the cult of the emperor. Thus, this term was often used by pagans of their own priests. So, as a tentative conclusion, we suggest that Sceva was an apostate Jew who had become priest of a pagan god, and his sons were using pagan exorcism ceremonies, attempting to leverage the name of Jesus. Read verses 17 through 19. And then discuss, what have we in our homes that we should burn? What kinds of pagan apparatus, false books, false scriptures, demonic materials that may be a curse to our home or family? Find these, root them out, and burn them. Verse 20, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Alternatively, the Greek text could be translated legitimately, Thus, with might of the Lord, the word increased and strengthened. Well then, how could we make the word of the Lord to increase and to spread in our city? What is the evidence that our message has prevailed? How will we know? Verses 21 and 22. Note the five localities on the map, from Asia going to Macedonia and Achaia, down to Jerusalem, and eventually up to Rome. As an alternative, legitimate translation, we could say, Paul resolved in his spirit. In this context, which is more likely, Paul's spirit or the Holy Spirit? Surmise together, why would Paul resolve to go again to Jerusalem? And why would he resolve to go to Rome? Time permitting, ask all participants in your group, what did we learn from this passage? Let everyone reply. What shall we do about it? Listen carefully to suggestions. What should we ask God to do? Close your time together, asking God to undertake powerfully in your city and region as he did in Ephesus and Asia. For your next session, 
please read Acts chapter 20, then study carefully verses 17 through 38, trying to reply to these five queries. Where and how did Paul spend most of his ministry energy whilst in Ephesus? What was Paul's driving motivation for his ministry work? What charge did Paul give to the church elders and overseers? What example did Paul leave for them? And what were their and Paul's mutual sentiments? You are welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 22, intended for those who study alone or who lead discussion groups with men.